Good evening, Europe. Good evening, Abu Dhabi, and good morning, US. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you to another lecture of extreme architecture in the modules uh, in the module of emerging fields in architecture. Today we have uh, Madhu Tangavelo with us. He is a space architect well known in the space architecture community over many years. Um, he conducts also a graduate program on space exploration architecture at the Department of Astrical Engineering at the University of Southern California. There he also, then he also teaches extreme environment habitation in the School of Architecture. He is also a graduate thesis advisor his educational background is in architecture and also in engineering. And in addition, he is a graduate of the International Space University. I know uh, Madhu Tangavelo for many, many years now and got first in contact with his work via his famous book, I have to say, it's called The Moon, Resources, Future Development and Colonization. Uh, it was one of the few books that I used for my thesis and it is, I can recommend it. I think it's a new edition already coming up and it's uh, really well written, uh, well structured. And what I like also from Madhu is because he's an architect, he is very well in sketching and drawing and uses his abilities throughout his work a lot. So uh, thank you very much Madhu for coming, joining our studio. We are very much looking forward to your work and also to discuss with you following the lecture. Uh, the floor uh, is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Musberger. Did I say your last name right, Sandra? Oh, I, I lost your uh, I lost your voice there. Um, you're muted, but uh, oh, good. It, um, it, it's well. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, thank you all um, for this opportunity to engage um, you all um, in a talk uh, about uh, our moon. Um, you know, um, uh, Sandra was um, so kind uh, to give out a bio. Um, you know, I get dragged into um, a different, um, uh, um, different organizations at different times. Uh, I most often am a willing victim um, uh, right now, I am part of the uh, National Space Society in the United States, and uh, also uh, part of the uh, Moon Village Association, which is very active in Europe. And I think Sandra will uh, show us, maybe even have somebody from the Moon Village talk to you uh, during the course of this emerging fields in architecture. It's very interesting because uh, at USC too, we have a program with exactly the same name. And it's been running for the last few years. <laughs> and uh, yours truly uh, is a willing victim uh, in that program as well. And so um, uh, without further ado, uh, may I share the slides, uh, Sandra? Yes, please. Let me go here. Give me one second while I pull up. You know, I had sent these slides to you, but you did not get them. But I will, I will send them to you after our talk. Um, <clears throat> what does this, what does the screen say now, Sandra? Uh, I think you have to share again. Okay, one minute. <clears throat> And all of you, please put your questions in the chat and we will go through it 
following the talk. It is working, thank you. What slide do you see now? Uh, I see the whole PowerPoint. So it's not in presentation modus yet. I see the first slide okay, there now, you go. now it works. Okay, great. Um, uh, um, good afternoon, everybody. Actually, it's actually it's good evening, right? Um, and uh, uh, for Abu Dhabi, it's probably uh, what time is it in Abu Dhabi, Sandra? It's two Thanks. hours later. But do we have someone here from ADU? Uh, yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Hello. Hello. What's the time now? Seven. At night. It's a night. It's night time for them. Thank okay, you for great. joining us too late. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's wonderful that um, uh, you know the silver lining um, uh, in uh, in the environment that occurred in the last two years is one of these things. Uh, we have really uh, become a global community uh, in real time, and. Uh, uh, it fascinates me that uh, that nature can push us to do things uh, um, in ways uh, that we did not anticipate. But anyhow, um, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. Um, uh, uh, Professor Musburger wanted me to talk about um, sustainable practices on the moon. And um, so I picked lunar tourism. And uh, this is the poster I shared with her. Um, as Sandra mentioned, I like to draw. I don't draw too much these days, but uh, 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 a lot of our drawings are in the moon book that Sandra mentioned. I hope you all pick it up. Um, but with that, let me um, go to um, what the scope of our talk today is. Um, it's a... Uh, um, it's a mix of things I want to convey to you all. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the history, a little bit of philosophy. I enjoy philosophy. I'll talk a little bit about our grad studio, some current NASA moon programs, some technologies that may be relevant to some of the things you are, all of you are studying. I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you all some questions before you ask me some. And then we'll go on to some ideas on lunar tourism, commercial future and discussion. Um, now, um, uh, I don't know the first introduction that all of you um, need to have is with our moon. And uh, this is how the moon looked um, two weeks ago. Uh, if you look up at the sky um, uh, today or tomorrow, if the skies are clear, you will see uh, Jupiter close to our moon. And so it's a very bright um, object uh, close to our moon uh, the past few uh, weeks. Uh, Saturn is up in the sky. So, so the most joyful thing to do is uh, to look up at the night sky and see our moon among the stars. I do this uh, maybe uh, once or twice a month when the skies are clear in Southern California. And I enjoy it thoroughly. And uh, you know, so the moon has become a friend over the years. If you look carefully, you'll get to see um, the, the different parts of the moon, the different things on the moon, the mares, the, the, the dark shades on the moon and the craters. And when you, when, you, when you look at it more and more, you'll get curious about the various parts and their names. And uh, you'll get to see them. All you need to do is Google and you can connect the dots about what these plates are. For instance, Plato is that beautiful thing right here. And then you go down here and you got the most 
significant uh, landmark, which is Copernicus. And all of these are named after great astronomers. And then you go down here, you got Tycho. And then you look over there, you got Aristarchus. These are all, these are all features on the moon that existed before there were humans on planet Earth. It tickles me to no end to think that this object has been going around our planet and watching evolution as it happened over the millions of years. Now, a few years ago, we have a, a very interesting man here um, who, who keeps a home not too far from here and has an office um, a few miles down the road from here. And his name is Elon Musk. Now, um, Elon um, was asked to present at the uh, International Astronautical Congress some years ago. It happened to be in Mexico. And he presented this slide. By then, everybody knew him as a Mars man. He wanted to go to Mars, settle Mars, populate Mars, and have a completely new planet for humanity called Mars. So he goes to IAC in 2017 and he asked this question, why don't we have a lunar base? It's 2017. And this question bothered a lot of people and bothers me today. Now quickly, um, the moon has been in our sights for a long time. Um, from the 1950s, we've been looking at the at building um, lunar bases and uh, not much has changed from the thinking processes of that time, but for the new technologies we now possess. There were ideas to put um, in large antennas on the far side of the moon to explore you know, further out, look for the extraterrestrial intelligence. And several beautiful ideas. You know, I love people who draw and that's why I enjoy talking with all of you because every one of you is uh, in a position to produce visionary images. I must admit that Sandra sent me a whole bunch of books that were done in her studio that I thoroughly enjoyed. So now, um, if you look at these images, it tells you and it, it dates you, it, it dates the image by the technologies that are used in them. Um, as we get closer to our time, we start to see more uh, uh, recognizable um, ideas on what could be built on the moon. Now, um, one thing that has occupied uh, my mind uh, uh, for several years now is why do we do these things? Why do we, the species, I mean, I mean humanity, why do we do these things like exploring, uh, wanting to know what is out there and what is the reason for our existence and so on? Um, so I want you to look at what um, Simon Sinek says about this. <clears throat> um, he says, that is the right question to ask at the beginning of any activity, any uh, project, any um, engaging new discipline, even education. Why do you go to school? Why do you do architecture? Why do you take the emerging fields in architecture course? And once you have a handle on that, the how and the what become very easy to do. And not only does it become easy to do, but once you know why you are doing something, you're able to gain the confidence of others who can help you to do your work much, much faster and more productively. And this comes across not only in um, uh, our thinking here, but also in the larger organizations. In the 1960s, um, we had a young president by the name of John Kennedy, and he said, we should go to the moon 
to make us a better species, to make us, to measure the best of our species. I mean, that was a challenge. You know what? We got to do that. And in the, in the process, we made a very powerful workforce. And this is, these are the things, this is why we do what we think are difficult to do, but you also know that difficult things become easy once you do them over and over again. <clears throat> so to talk about a little bit of philosophy, the current philosophy core, uh, you have these people. Some of them you know as the wealthiest people on the planet. Others we know through their contributions to society in different areas. Uh, Musk wants us to settle other planets as, as human insurance. Uh, Jeff Bezos wants to protect planet Earth and put all of the manufacturing outside so that we don't continue to mess up planet Earth. John Marburger was our dean at USC before he became a George Bush Sr.'s advisor at the Science and Technology Office. And he said something very interesting. He said, we should go out and reap the rewards of the solar system, to go out and, and uh, use the resources of the solar system. Joseph Campbell, all of you know, uh, was the mentor for um, George Lucas, the Star Wars guru. George is an alumnus of USC, so we see him at USC sometime, and is a Museum of the Narrative Arts is coming up right across from our, our um, campus. And then there is um, um, Dyson, um, Freeman Dyson, uh, who uh, 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 was a very good friend, but uh, he passed on uh, two years ago. Um, Freeman Dyson said um, that you look up at the skies, it's all black, there is nothing happening, it is cold, and it looks uh, frozen. Probably it is our species that has to beautify it, to go out there and make it pretty. I mean, I, I had not heard that till Freeman told me that, but um, it's something to think about. And of course, you all should know Frank White uh, here. Um, Frank comes on air often. In fact, he was at the philosophy meeting uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, he thinks that once we rise ourselves up outside of planet Earth and look at the bounty and the beauty of the planet, we become um, uh, a new awareness comes upon us. And some astronauts tell us that. They feel that it changes them because you go out and you don't see any wars, you don't see any pestilence, uh, you don't see any terrible things except a beautiful blue planet and a very thin atmosphere. And he wants us to, to experience what he calls the overview effect. And now, very recently in the past few years, we have a group of people saying that we should preserve our species cultural heritage outside of planet Earth. We have sent out spacecraft, some have landed in different um, planets, so many are on the moon, um, and we think these are culturally important historical artifacts, much like the pyramids in Egypt or uh, any other, other Stonehenge in England, I'm sure there are historical heritage sites in Austria and several of them in the Middle East. Um, and there must be things in uh, um, um, all over Europe. And um, you know, we have what's called the World Heritage, heritage Sites that look at these kinds of things and uh, um, preserve them. So it's only natural that we should preserve artifacts outside of planet Earth. Now, <clears throat> Neil Armstrong is a name all of you may be familiar with. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first two humans to set foot on the moon. Both of them have USC connections. Neil Armstrong graduated from USC. While he was 
getting ready for the mission to the moon. There's a whole interesting story about him approaching the dean and asking him for leave. The dean asked him what he wants to do. And he said, I want to go to the moon. I'm asked to go to the moon. So the dean looks up and says, that, that's not a problem. It takes some time off. Uh, write up that, that could be part of your thesis. And uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's so understated. Buzz Aldrin comes to our studio often. He watches all the fun things we do. We want to go look at our site. And, um, and, uh, and looking out, looking towards the future, looking towards space um, is a very interesting thing, not only looking out, but also uh, gaining a better understanding of our footing on planet Earth. This is Neil Armstrong's thesis that he came back and uh, reported to USC and then on to Johnson Space Center. You may like to take a look at it. It's on Google. And this is my favorite photo of the young uh, Neil Armstrong. He was a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base about 100 miles north of here. And it's an incredible place to visit. Even now we have several test pilots flying new vehicles there. And here you see him posing in what I call one of the finest spacesuit designs ever made. And uh, it is the Gemini, Gemini G2 spacesuit. We have a very big, uh, bigger than life uh, statue of Neil Armstrong in our courtyard, in the engineering courtyard. Here you see um, some students who were visiting us uh, during a lecture day uh, from University College London. So whenever you have a chance, if you happen to be at USC or in Southern California, maybe going to Disneyland or someplace, give us a call. I'm happy to tour you um, our campus and our astronautical engineering and architecture departments. USC has an astronautical engineering department. It's very different than an aerospace engineering department. Uh, we look at things beyond the atmosphere of Earth and where we have a loss of gravity, altered gravity, and things become very, very different. So this program has been running for a while. And my course is a part of it. And uh, I also teach in the School of uh, Architecture as uh, your professor mentioned. What, does, uh, what do we do in our studio? We, it's a small studio. When I, when I heard that your professor was handling 50, um, 50 students, I was going like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of work. Um, we uh, usually have between 10 and 15 in the class. We meet once a week for, for a three hour meeting. And the focus is really on unleashing your creativity and imagination. Your professor does it very well too. And I focus, or I try to focus my students on being original. And many of them are afraid to be original because they think they may say something wrong. But unless you say something wrong, how do you know you're going to be right? It's a very interesting point. So think about it. Unless you create, you don't know what is right or wrong. And many of us miss that point and we are afraid to create. So I want all of you to engage in creating and I know that your professor will make you create in the coming days and weeks. As you know, you're sitting, all of us are in academia, which means we don't really um, uh, fancy the whims of the industry or the agencies we have the liberty to think uh, independently and you should treasure that all your lives. The only thing I stress is take your pencil and sketch something quickly. You see images like this. You know, it's, in this one it says, if you go under the lunar soil, you can, you can preserve yourself during the lunar night. And the student made this drawing. Please go to our site and take a look at what we do.
um, yeah, um, you know, I've been at it, as Sandra said, for several years. And uh, we have had some very interesting uh, discussions, and most of them appear here. In, uh, this is one of our classes. As I mentioned, our class is small, but our reviewers and guests are usually large. We will host 100 people uh, during our presentations. And when somebody like Buzz Aldrin comes to a final presentation, the crowds get even bigger. Here you see uh, the chair, um, film producers, professors from architecture, different branches of engineering, from the industry. Everybody comes to our studio. And I know that Sandra too enjoys that kind of luxury from people like Bernard Foy, because I watched some of the images that uh, I get to see. <clears throat> so in the fall, in the fall, I teach in the School of Engineering, where we do forward thinking on lunar bases, Mars bases, and so on. In the spring, I am forced to um, tackle architecture students, graduate architecture students. They ask very hard questions. I'm sure all of you will too. Um, and as you can see, the students at USC come from all over the world. I'm sure this is with the same with uh, Sanders class too. Um, it really reflects a global, a global um, consciousness and a global um, lookout for things um, in space and in our solar system that go way beyond the usual tasks offered of a space of, a, of an architecture student. But they also ask sharp questions. Architects want to know what can space do for the human predicament on planet Earth? And um, so between the fall and the spring, I get to get my feet on the ground and think about what space activity and space technology can do for humanity now on the globe. Now, thinking about, about the projects that we are about, there are three programs at least of interest to us with regard to the moon that NASA is engaged in. One is a precursory mission that is building robots to land on the moon. I know that the UAE is involved in it. I know that other nations are involved in it. And uh, it's called CLIPS. In, uh, in, 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 at NASA, it's called CLIPS. Um, it means commercial lunar payload services. And um, it involves tiny vehicles and tiny robots that are being built by private organizations where NASA is a customer, not the builder or the operator, not the builder or the designer, but the customer. And this is a new thing for NASA. And uh, it is slowly happening in the bigger projects at NASA too. The second mission is the Gateway Project, which is the idea of putting a habitat um, in an orbit around the moon to be uh, the test bed to evolve uh, the Mars transit vehicle. And then there's a third program that is gaining pace right now. It is to land a, a two people, a woman and a man on the lunar surface by 2024. And that is, that is a very short uh, time from now. So things are happening in that arena too. So um, as you know, transitions happen in administrations. The agency is very closely tied to the aspirations of every administration. So when a new administration comes in, there are changes. And right now a transition has happened and there are some new ideas coming in uh, that you will hear more about even before the end of the year. Uh, the National Space Council is just seated 
and they have a new executive director. The vice president will be the will be the executive uh, of it, and, uh, and will be the chair. And uh, the executive director will have some interesting to tell us in November. So uh, in the new policy we know coming down, the little bird telling us is that climate change is big on the agenda for NASA for this administration. Take note of this, climate change on planet Earth. So the question comes back to what the architects have been asking me for several years in the spring semester. What can space do for people on Earth? Climate change is a big, very big and very important um, topic to discuss. In terms of the CLIPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program, people are already building the vehicles um, uh, to, to land um, robot, robotic um, um, agents on the moon. Uh, and uh, um, some of them will be landing on the lunar equ equatorial regions and some on the polar regions. And um, uh, the tests are underway on some vehicles and rovers and so on. In the Gateway project, uh, we are aggregating uh, various components uh, and some elements are already ready, including the power and propulsion element. And um, um, the work is in progress, um, connecting the whole world of nations to take part in the Gateway project. Um, you know, there are discussions um, underway and uh, uh, I'm sure it'll bear fruit, but uh, it will take time. Um, in the Artemis program, um, one of the clear components that are needed is to be able to descend safely from lunar orbit to the lunar surface. And so there's a, there's a component system called the human landing system. And uh, several contracts have been made to study them. Um, there were um, main, there were some winners and some losers. Um, and, uh, and now um, the project has been restructured after the initial award for SpaceX to land their Starship on the moon. And, uh, um, and now we know that uh, uh, there's a lot of studies going on uh, on on proceeding with the SpaceX Starship mission, but also uh, alternatives are being studied. Uh, all of you know this man, I think, on the uh, on the left of my screen. Um, you know, rocketry is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, we uh, we um, had to do some unusual creative thinking to be able to launch um, uh, and sustain um, vehicles in orbit. And uh, 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 here you see um, um, uh, the former director of, of um, NASA uh, uh, suggesting how we would get people to go to Mars uh, using the fuels of the 1950s and 60s, which we now consider um, extremely toxic and dangerous for uh, for humans and for the uh, and for the environment um, but it tells you how we progress and we make uh, make uh, things happen and the rockets by themselves cannot fly if we don't pay attention to this whole thing called staging and uh, this is how it was done in the past but now we're getting better at it and even better at it, so we don't throw away stages anymore. You, some of you may have, uh, I'm sure all of you have sat in classes in high school that told you about Newton's law, and we apply that as part of, um, of, the, uh, uh, of the logic behind a rocketry. So the current narrative is to send rockets, fly them off, stage them 
and put them on the moon over a period of time. And uh, uh, ideally, we would like to put people on the lunar surface by uh, 2024. And uh, uh, before that, we'll have the clips and then larger, uh, larger vehicles, larger cargo vehicles, and then finally, the humans in 2024. And the lunar South Pole is a target site, though our students at USC disagree with this matter. They don't think the polar region of the moon is a safe place for the first uh, Artemis crew to land. So um, there are many, um, many systems involved. They include rovers, different kinds of tools, pressurized rovers to carry people around in habitable and mobility platforms and a variety of um, infrastructure is planned for the moon in the coming years. So this is again a, a view of uh, what we plan to do. The gateway um, the gateway uh, targets to, to orbit the moon in a very interesting way called the uh, halo orbit to go into uh, a polar orbit and uh, uh, keep um, your crew up there for a long period of time so that they can continually be visiting the polar region and perhaps helping um, the crew at the polar regions um, uh, build up their capabilities. If you look at the ADAM project that we did in 2018, um, in 2017, uh, you will see uh, what we proposed for the uh, for the um, gateway orbit mission, uh, which again we concluded may not be uh, the right thing to do for the gateway mission. As you can see, uh, artists make very be beautiful pictures. Um, uh, this is a view of uh, artists uh, of astronauts um, on the polar region of the moon. Um, on a very bright day, and this, might, this is how it might look, but for most part, it's a very dark and foreboding place meant for robots in, our, in the opinion of our students. So um, to move Artemis program forward, um, NASA put out what's called the Artemis Accords. They, they suggested that if you do such and such, such and such, such and such, uh, then you can join our team, join our club. Um, it, it's been out there only for a year and a half. And um, we are slowly bringing people together to form our group. Um, uh, some of the, um, of the people in our established group of the International Space Station um, um, team are not yet uh, sure that they want to be part of it, but it's a slow process. And I'm sure that the Artemis Accords will adjust and change some of the rules and some of the norms um, to accept new partners over time. So that's the Artemis Accords. Now you may have access by just Google, through Google or through the NASA website to go take a look at the um, space policy of the United States of America. You will also have access to some of the earlier documents uh, published uh, in the last administration, including this one called A New Era for Deep Space Exploration and Development. Uh, the executive director was Scott Pace. He talked at USC and uh, um, you know, it's a very interesting document to see how the United States looks out to, to see the future of human spaceflight. One thing that comes across in the New Era document is that um, we express our notions about freedom and free world values. Um, though the document itself is um, not related to any administration, does not indicate any preference for administration, it's agnostic. 
I think there are some areas of um, interest for the whole globe and some areas where uh, you may challenge them. But of course, it's an American document and you want to read it so that it may help you with your design um, in this particular course. Um, my favorite um, term that I use in the United States, e pluribus unum, which means we bring people together, diversity, strength and diversity. I'm sure this is the case with Professor Sandra's class two with 50 people from all over the world. Now, some of the challenges that we have, you can call them technological challenges or the amount of fuel that it takes to take a rocket ship from Earth to the moon. Um, when you look at a rocket ship, uh, you'll see that 99% of it is fuel and only 1% is, um, is uh, usable. In the, in the best case, it'll be two or 3% that is usable. And the 97% is fuel. So we take a lot of fuel to do these things. So we are thinking that one way to accomplish this uh, easily is to pre-position, to put fuel in orbit so that you can use it when you like it, much like a gas station that you drive to, to pick up fuel to go further. An area of interest right now is precision landing. Um, I may show you a few more figures later on, but landing at a predetermined place accurately is not easy for, um, for landers. Um, and we are getting better at it. And um, as you know, the Perseverance lander um, that uh, NASA put uh, on Mars was very accurate because we use new kinds of technologies that literally give the spacecraft eyes to see where it is landing. And we call it terrain relative navigation. It's a very interesting technology. When you land a vehicle in on a surface, most of the time, or all of the time, there will not be a prepared runway or a prepared landing pad because you are landing for the first time in a place that has been that has not been landed upon for millions of years, and so you will generate a lot of debris. So how to avoid that, particularly for larger vehicles? We think we need landing pads. I have worked on some. Uh, I'm sure um, your class may like to work on some, and it's very important because if you have a habitat close by. To, um, to a place where you land, every time you land, you're going to be throwing debris off and that can pretty much decimate anything in the surrounding region. So you need a safe landing pad as an early, you know, early component of design to make sure that you don't, uh, you don't cause accidents through a hypersonic ejector from debris uh, impacting our astronauts or their habitats. Radiation is a very big problem. Radiation can kill. And uh, my co-author on, on our moon look was director of radiation medicine at a major hospital in California. So he would tell me how patients suffer under chemotherapy and uh, bigger doses can kill you. And we know how people suffered during the buildup of, um, of the atomic revolution in the 1950s, when many people were subject to excessive radiation, including some famous scientists, and uh, all of them perished because of radiation. And um, right now, um, when a nuclear reactor goes down, uh, as happened in Fukushima or in Chernobyl, we see cases of how radiation can affect people. It's not pretty, it's very sad. So this can happen to our astronauts unless we take care of them and shield them from the radiation of space, both from the sun and from extragalactic sources called 
galactic cosmic radiation. In spite of doing everything right, sometimes things go wrong. So when they do, what do you do to rescue them or about a mission? It is something we don't study often, but engineers do pay great deal of attention to it. So you can have interesting discussions on how you design so that you can quickly exit and quickly, um, quickly uh, uh, take care of um, um, the, uh, the crew. So these are some areas of, they, they are challenges. And in some ways, um, we ask all of you to think about these things. Um, some of the technologies that are important are um, coming uh, on now, they include fully reusable space transportation systems. That is what the Starship aims to do. And that is partially what the Falcon series of rockets do in the 21st century. People who throw away parts, uh, you can very quickly call them dinosaurs of the 20th century. Many of our rockets are still that, uh, belong to that, um, that era. And we are quickly moving towards fully reusable transportation systems. It saves us an order of magnitude in cost because we are using the same vehicle over and over. Nuclear power is on the table to be revisited both for power and for propulsion. You may recall that in the 1960s, NASA had a very, very strong nuclear, um, uh, nuclear rocket um, development capability. You know, we did a lot of good work then, and now we're restarting this because once you bring nuclear power, uh, you don't have to depend on many other sources and auxiliary sources for power and propulsion. And um, you know, we may see some very interesting developments there. Robotics and telerobotics is all over the place. In, in our daily lives, we have telemedicine, we have remote learning, and these things came out of the space program uh, many years ago. And now it's time for us to re-engage them to make things happen more effectively in space, helping our crew, sometimes working together, sometimes as remote objects, remote agents. Communications is seeing a very big change. We use optical communications on Earth to connect fiber, op fiber optically to various components all around the globe. Um, now we want to use lasers in free space communications between the Earth and the Moon, and even between missions that are much further out. The European Space Agency is doing some work. JPL over here is doing some very interesting work. And NASA has conducted some, some important um, laser communications experiment between the moon and the earth. So those things are important. Uh, terminal guidance and navigation, like I mentioned, uh, you know, the ability for the spacecraft without even the pilot knowing, the spacecraft eyes will tell you where it wants to land and do a precision landing on the spot that it picks. Um, it's a very important uh, development and landing pads. These are technologies that may appear in some of your designs, I hope. To give you a rough idea about how the Apollo um, even happened, um, you know, we are used to planes and cars you know, moving um, in our gravity um, well, uh, but uh, that is not the way Newtonian physics works. There is no air, and you are under the influence of gravity, you're fighting gravity, and you're trying to land at a spot using Newtonian physics. So when you do that, you'll realize it's a very different ball game. Uh, and here you see how shallow, how fast, how quick things happen before something that is up in the sky comes down and lands. And um, we are good at this now and getting better at it. The interior of vehicles, maybe some of you will think about that. This is the interior of the lunar module. 
And um, it's a pretty nice space. Okay, I can barely see this picture, but it tells you that it is designed for um, good visibility and very quick action on the part of the pilots uh, in case you need to abort the system. Yours truly in here tells you how spacious these things are, though it seems um, those, though it seems tight, when you go in there, you'll see that it's designed to make your crew comfortable during these very critical phases of landing. Um, there are big changes happening in the way we build and we design and build um, cockpits. Um, in the past, there used to be a lot of switches, there used to be a lot of wiring, and they slowly converted them to what we call the glass cockpit. We started to see them in the shuttle, and this is how the, the interior of the 21st century spacecraft look like. They're completely glass cockpits with touch screens, very similar to what we use on our computers and our cell phones. And you will notice that also the, the aesthetic has moved on um, in the new generation of spacecraft. You're looking at the Dragon capsule, the Crew Dragon capsule. You will see the lines are very smooth. There is more um, you know, breathable air volume uh, in there. And you will see in numerous sensors and cameras looking at the crew, looking at the, uh, looking at the, at the dash, looking at um, every aspect happening within uh, the cabin. Uh, here you see images uh, of the, um, the terrain relative navigation that I talked about. I don't want to explain it to you, but you can look at the slides when I give it to your professor. It tells you two or three things are happening. One, the visual acuity of our robots have improved tremendously. They can see things that not even humans can, and they can react quicker than humans can. And here you see how fast things happen during a distant entry and landing. All these things are done using very small, physically small um, elements. And, uh, uh, and they react very quickly. And uh, humans can do that at this time, unless we are Superman or something. And uh, look at that. It tells you how small the finest cameras are on board. And there are several of them because they are light and small. You can connect them. They use very little power and they are able to do things um, that humans cannot do in real time. Uh, here you see the Perseverance rover attached with many, many, many sensors. And all of them are very tiny. Look at the cameras all very small. And the sample handling, it, um, recently you probably heard that it has a sampling, sample handling capability, and it's been drilling rocks, putting them back into these containers so that we can bring them back for um, further study. These are how small these things are. That is the microphone on it. And look how tiny it is on the, on the vehicle. So these things are happening. And the visual acuity is incredible. Uh, if you notice over here, um, you take an image and then you blow it up and you can pick out the pebbles and rocks uh, on, on the surface and, or, at, at, at the horizon. So uh, these kinds of things humans can never expect to do, um, perhaps with genetic engineering later on, but for now, we don't do that. We make our robots do them for you. In, in such a way that they, are, they assist uh, in human space flight. That is my rendition of a lunar landing pad. Uh, we think we can do this using um, um, 3D printing. Mm, you know, we uh, did some studies uh, for NASA at USC and are not confident yet that we can uh, do this entirely uh, using robots. It will require human supervision. So we think one way to do this would be to land humans next to the robots and use what we call 
co-robot or cobot activity where you supervise a robot in real time uh, on the lunar surface. Here you see uh, what I mean by that. Um, uh, you see uh, very large robots um, uh, using regolith um, and casting uh, structures with a crew next to them uh, controlling uh, their, their activities. And this is not new. We are doing this on planet Earth now. And I think, um, I think your professor will already brought. Um, Sandra, did you, did you already have a Melody talk? I, I thought I saw a poster. Yes, Melanie was the first one. She was here last week. Oh, so, so she did talk about uh, in this particular technology of yes. uh, building, um, building uh, uh, structures. And uh, they are right now building uh, a Mars, um, uh, a Mars habitat, simulating that uh, for a simulator to conduct um, simulated studies for crew. So these things happen. So again, the game changer technologies that you can expect to see in the coming years, in fact, they are already on the launch pad, uh, are very large rocket ships because larger rocket ships, as I mentioned, can carry more payloads. They can also be fully uh, reusable. And uh, uh, nuclear power is coming online and free space laser communication has got a new, um, a new um, lease on life. Uh, the problem with communication always has been interference. So uh, how do you tackle interference in different, um, with different frequencies? We know that if you use optical communications, you can point and shoot and it won't interfere with somebody else's um, you know, somebody else's uh, uh, transmission or reception. So I think this is going to play a big role. Now you can take a little break. Sorry if I rushed you guys, uh, let me see. How are we doing on time? Good, very well. Thank you. It's, uh... <laughs> okay, uh, let me ask all of you some questions if you can see me. What did you think of the inspiration for a mission that happened just uh, uh, two weeks ago uh, when uh, uh, ordinary people uh, uh, were put on a, a private rocket ship and sent into orbit? And it did, uh, it, uh, do we have a way? Are you able to see all your students, Sandra? Yes, can you see them? Um, I can see a lineup on my screen, but not all of them. Uh, yeah, that I also it's three pages kind of. No, but, is that right? Okay. But, okay but, that. Do, but do you know that Blue Origin just successfully committed the, the, completed the, the yes, indeed. Uh, with this William was something Pepper. that is right with with Captain Kirk uh, during you know, your talk. That is right, and uh, you know I think I think these are important events in our. Uh, a human space flight because uh, uh, it is pushing us into a new dimension of how we perceive uh, humans uh, uh, reaching out into, into, into the future. But anyhow, I just want to know what your students thought about the inspiration for a mission that put people into orbit for a few days and brought them back. And this is a question that I asked my class, but I put it in there. Um, you don't have to respond to it, but just give it some thought. The second question is, what is your opinion of government funded um, launch vehicles like the, uh, the space launch system? Is it good or bad? Give it some thought. Um, I would ask my students here whether they would rather work for NASA or a private space company. And maybe in Europe, you would ask, would you rather work for a private space company or for the European Space Agency? This is a hard question people are asking 
who will get, go back to the moon first? Will it be the Artemis crew? Or will it be China, the Chinese National Space Agency? Or will it be a private space company? And then when it happened, something to think about. Um, what is your opinion on Gateway? Is this an interesting way to do this? Or do all of you think there is a better way to do it? And the International Space Station, what do you think will happen in the coming years? Will it, will it um, be uh, brought back and burnt up in the atmosphere? Or do you see a future for it? <laughs> this is a good question for architecture students. Which spacesuit do you like better? <laughs> be honest. Uh, <laughs> it is something to think about. And uh, now I want to spend a little time on what it means to design. What is it that your professor and some of us um, in the architecture school are hoping that you do? You're looking at Harry Lang, uh, who was um, a part of Werner von Braun's group and a designer who, who studied industrial engineering in uh, Germany before he moved to the US to support the US space program. And he found his calling um, in designing for the famous movie called 2001, A Space Odyssey. And Harry Lang's design inspired me to this day. These are his hand drawings, his models that he built. I mean, there was something beautiful and charming about building uh, with the hand as opposed to a 3D printer. These are his designs and that you will see in the movie. And I love, every time I see this, I got to po go post with them wherever they are. Uh, these models cost a lot of money, but you know what? They are still uh, fascinating and uh, study in how designs for spacecraft were supposed to be in the 1960s. And uh, here you see the drawings of, uh, of um, Lang and how these things transpire into the real world is fascinating. Question number seven, uh, where do you think the Artemis, Artemis um, mission should land? On the pole or at the Apollo site, which is what our students think we should do? And what would the crew make up be for the Apollo mission. Now let's start, think about that in your past, in your, in your, in your class or uh, in, your, um, in your rooms. Um, but now let me spend a little time with the future. There's a term called sustainable and sustainability and that is um, being thrown around a lot. And it means many different things for different entities. For the governments, it means, for the government agencies like NASA and ESA, it means how do you take some money that is appropriated to them yearly and spend it? <laughs> that is what sustainable means for them. For the private industry, it means entirely different. It means how do you sustain a business model? It requires profits. And there is a famous equation which says profit equal to revenue minus cost. This is the principle by which commerce sustains itself and does created things. Why do we put humans in the moon? These are questions for you to think about. Is it for utilization or is it for human um, open-ended exploration? It is for both, but for commerce, it's very clear it is for utilization. And the, um, the idea is that we want to make something happen and let it happen by itself without um, further uh, help. Just like you are a child and you grow up, you become self-sustaining. And that is what you want to do in time. And the evolution of it is very simple. You start suborbital, as you saw this morning, and as you saw um, in the past few months, it gets to Earth orbital over time, and then it becomes uh, goes out further. Some of our projects studied that, 
and then finally a lunar landing. This is how uh, evolution works in our system. Why is commerce important? Because it, it literally makes wars obsolete. It really makes people more connected in the world and all of them um, have synergies, synergistic benefits. And, um, you know, there are people who think that you have to fight to maintain your standard of living and to, and to promote development within our, our um, uh, communities. But I don't agree with that because history tells you that when you have commerce, when you have beautiful engagement between nations, we always, always, always um, have friendly relations. Um, I cannot um, uh, explain some of the happenings in the past history, as uh, Cato the Younger mentioned that um, Carthage must be destroyed. There were other reasons for it. And then Alison Graham at Harvard tells me that there's a thing called Thucydides trap, where uh, an emerging civilization is going to be attacked by an established civilization. I don't buy that either. And then um, there was a, a BBC reporter who called me and I told them that if, if the world's greatest people got together and the militaries got together, we can have an incredible, <laughs> in the amount of money we spent on these things, warring each other, if it were spent on creative purposes like space, we could do fascinating things. That is true for human spaceflight. So let me get to the pit of the problem, which is human tourism, lunar tourism. I think all of you are familiar with the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. If not, your professor will tell you more about it. There are several articles and several um, treaties called the Outer Space Treaty, the Moon Agreement, and now from NASA, the Artemis Accords. All of this have thorns in them that make it very difficult to navigate, to do some interesting things. So what can we do easily that don't trample on these very sacrosanct laws and law missions, law aspects? Dear Moon is a project that is happening right now. It's gaining steam and you want to Google it. It is through SpaceX and you want to study it. It could be a starting block to do things in space. And my theory is we can do something on the moon without messing up the lunar terrain. That is what we call lunar orbital tours. Over time, we can study this. We explain this in our moon book. That is our moon book that uh, your professor mentioned. Buzz Aldrin wrote the foreword for it. And this is what um, I had put down on my uh, poster I sent to Sandra. Um, uh, I studied um, the idea of building stuff on and around Earth, putting them all together and then flying it out in one piece to the lunar surface. It was my thesis. And uh, I used to build with my hand. It's been a while since I built any models, but this is a model that we built. And the images that you look over here tell you what um, it might look like. Again, all hand built. A few years ago, I showed this to my daughter and she said, you know, the way to make space um, activity happen without NASA to make it sustainable is to bring commerce in. So these are commercial activities. As I mentioned, <laughs> this is also the question that Elon Musk is asking and uh, you know, the things that we are doing here. And uh, where do you start this? We are confident that this has to happen in Earth orbit, not at the moon, but you bring things together in Earth orbit and then go further out. These are some of the ideas we have, and you can go on our site and see them. We can build things in Earth orbit near space station and fly them out. We can build beautiful uh, space stations in orbit around the Earth, and we can have 
a fascinating um, uh, new life, a new dimension in living in Earth orbit. And to go to the moon, it takes only two and a half days. It's not very far. So for a holiday of a week, it's very possible to go into orbit around the moon and be back. As um, SpaceX mentions, that's the way they're going to be doing it. And here's a class project that we did that shows you what a gateway could do. The gateway could cycle between the earth and the moon. It could depart, to come back, but there are dangers. There are dangers. We know that solar storms can cause problems. I have, um, you may get more dosage of radiation because you're out there. So we have to be careful. We know how to look at this. We have studied um, uh, solar radiation and what we call the sunspot cycles. And we know what uh, to expect as we move into the next few years. That is how it looks like solar minimum. A few years later, you see a lot of spots. Every 11 years, you go through a cycle. So we know that during Artemis, we will be in this solar maximum period. We need to take care of it. So we know that we have to build solar storm shelters inside of a vehicle. I think your professor will tell you how solar storm shelters are built. The whole idea behind going to the moon is to be able to see with our eyes, create new visions. As we go out, you see the approach of uh, uh, the, the, the earth receding from you more and more. And of course, you know that the moon is a very small object compared to the earth. So as you recede, as you go to the moon and look from the moon towards earth, you get this million dollar view, which will change you for the rest of your life. This is what the overview effect tells us. When you come back, we didn't touch the moon. We got very close to the moon. We got to see the moon. And that could be the first phase of lunar tours. What would the future look like? As I said, the moon is a very small place and it is um, you know, not very far uh, by uh, rocketry standards. We would expect in the future to have simulated gravity on our vehicles because high net worth individuals don't want to suffer uh, being floating around in space for very long periods of time. Um, so we would like to have artificial gravity. We would like to have facilities that show that in, uh, in lunar orbit, have resorts there, landing pads, rovers to move around in, museums to visit the places where we have artifacts already. Uh, you can do some fascinating things um, for tourists. And uh, this is my only slide that talks about greenery, um, Sandra, but it tells you that we want to grow our food in extraterrestrial, on extraterrestrial surfaces. And the moon could be the first place to try that out. Build habitats underground, use robotics. Robots are already being built and we are already studying how to interact with them. And there is something to be said about humanoid robots. Um, there is something we are associated with when you see um, a, a structure or an agent, a robotic agent that is a bit like a human. You get to test out your um, spacesuits, um, ride on rovers and study them. My favorite thing that I would like to do is go into a train, a lunar train, and drive across some of these beautiful landmarks, speed across them and see them. And, you know, sometimes we get bogged down by science and technology for the sake of science and technology. Humans are not made for that. Humans are made to enjoy life. And we have to promote that area in our designs. We want to have habitats, we want to have time capsules, we want to have UN summits, we want to have, um, we have to protect ourselves in space, we have to protect ourselves 
on the lunar surface from micrometeorites and asteroids. We know how to do that. In the end, it's all about Earth and how we cherish life. Buckminster Fuller was a polymath here in the 60s and the 70s. In fact, way longer than that, but became uh, very prominent during the time. And he said, we are all astronauts. We are all astronauts. <laughs> we happen to be on one big spaceship called Earth. And space activities is telling us, is telling us how to live comfortably, creatively, um, and conform to nature to be able to recycle, rejuvenate, and not continuously be disposing of and cluttering, uh, cluttering space. So in summary, I would recommend that you all think about phase two origin as, um, as the first phase in, in bringing a notion of environmental sustainability to all of us. And uh, with that, I would conclude, uh, think about all these things, go to our website, take a look at it. <laughs> I must admit, I gotta tell you one thing, after all is said and done, uh, all of you know the golden rule uh, from the scriptures, but there's another go golden rule, which says that those who have the gold <laughs> make the rules. This I know from experience. In the committee, you will always find <laughs> uh, some people who control the rules. Uh, in our community, in the space community, it happens to be NASA. And uh, uh, I just want to let you know, keep that in mind. Architects know this. Um, one other thing that I also noticed is that when you draw something, when you imagine something, your professor gets some ideas about it. This was drawn in my class some years ago. I got some ideas of it two years later. So, so this interaction between the student and the faculty, faculty and the student, student and the industry, faculty and the industry is very, very important. And uh, with that, I will conclude and let uh, um, your professor uh, take over. Take a look at some of these uh, happenings in the past few, few weeks and months. And I think Sandra has several papers in the spacearchitect.org website. You want to look at that. With that, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Sandra, I ran over quite a bit, did I not? Um, I have to say yes, a little bit, but I think it was interesting and <laughs> uh, different also from the other talks, which I like a lot. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you, Madhu. Let's immediately start with the question. The first one is easy, it's by Alma. Uh, she just, she recognized Melody in one of the pictures and wanted to know if she was one of your students. Uh, who is this again? Hello, can you hear me? Can you Hi. see me? Hi. Hi. Yes, Alma. Uh, <laughs> My colleague and I were wondering if uh, Melody was one of your students, Melody Yashar. Uh, no, Me Melody, I've known her some time, and I invited her to review, um, to review the, the classwork. That is how she appeared in that picture. Okay. And we keep in touch. Uh, she is uh, not far from where I am, so uh, I am in close contact with, uh, with Melody and all of She's a very creative designer. Very nice. Thank you very much. Um, it, I already invited Alma to join the space architecture community. And she will see, and all you will see, it is cl close, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's a small community, friendly, and everybody knows each other after a while. Pretty much. I mean, you know, uh, and uh, 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 when you look at the... Uh, when you look at space architecture and as a quasi-discipline, 
Um, it's been around only 20 years. Um, you know, it, it was structured as a part of the AIAA technical, uh, technical Committee only in 2001. And uh, all of us were part of the, the founding group. So um, it's very young. And uh, again, uh, the, the ultimate ambition of all of us uh, in the space architecture community is not only to look forward to, to, um, to uh, outer space, but also to look within and see what we can do uh, to make life, uh, uh, provide new horizons in living and um, uh, cherish our planet, you know, and I think it's very important that, uh, you know, uh, the Biden administration has made it very clear under Bill Nelson, the administrator, the, uh, the new NASA administrator is a staunch advocate of, uh, of uh, climate change mitigation and earth sciences. So you will see many things coming down the NASA pipeline in that direction. And architects know this uh, more than and the engineers who design spacecraft, uh, that what we do uh, is, should be global and should have a reach into um, the civil architecture. Oh, this is good to see all of you, so many people. <laughs> good times. Yeah, it's great. Thank you for turning on the cameras. The next question is by Flora. She has left a few minutes ago. She asked me to ask you, and she will look at it later. Uh, her question is, with the technologies, have you ever thought about drone robotics? Do you think drones could function on the moon for getting around on this rough crater surface? <laughs> well, well, as you know. Uh, no, uh, Flora is not here anymore. She asked me to ask the question because she, has, she had to leave. Okay. But okay. she wants to know the answer. That's why I'm asking it. Okay. The answer is that uh, a, a different kind of drone, uh, because there is no atmosphere on the moon, um, it would be a drone, and that is a, a, a small suborbital rocket. It would have thrusters on it and it would fly around. And so, definitely, anything that can go up and scout uh, the terrain. Um, quickly, as opposed to a rover that takes much longer uh, to, to do that, um, uh, is welcome. So uh, the only thing is, when you draw it, don't draw it with propellers. <laughs> It'll have to be little thrusters that allow it to fly around. Um, okay, of course, of course, we will have a lot of robotics, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, we have already a lot of robotics and artificial intelligence on yes. in our daily life on Earth. So if we look to the future, I don't think we will have less. Yeah, you know, this term artificial intelligence, um, yeah, we debate that in the philosophy quite a bit. Um, what it translates to uh, in, in the technical arena is really about how machines learn and react to situations. And uh, it is very different uh, from uh, how humans think. Um, um, and now um, and you, you saw that case of um, the um, uh, terrain relative navigation. Um, you know, you give a machine eyes and command it, tell it, find a smooth spot and land. Um, it integrates uh, several algorithms together and finds a smooth place to land. Um, uh, if you compare that with what Apollo uh, astronaut Neil Armstrong had to do when he was landing, um, it's a different process in thought. Um, Neil was flying in he saw boulders and he got scared. He was afraid. And because of that, he reacted to move out and land. <laughs> Artificial intelligence does not have that scare for it. It has got this idea 
it has to find a smooth spot and land. If you told it, find a rock and land, it will land on a rock and kill itself. So, so there are differences in how humans work and think versus how machines work and think. Uh, it's just a problem. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Next question is by Vasco. Uh, yes. Um, yes. You mentioned that uh, one of the breakthrough technologies would be uh, um, uh, nuclear power sources in space. And so my question goes to um, when you have this nuclear material and you have to transport it from Earth to space, um, there's a high risk or there could be a risk for a global catastrophe. Or is there an option to use like uh, cosmic radiation or space radiation for, for generating uh, an energy source? Well, uh, um, you know, the transportation um, uh, uh, risk has always been there. And uh, you know, what we do now is we encase uh, nuclear materials um, well in advance uh, to know that if there is an abort or if there is an accident during uh, the flight, um, uh, you, the fuel uh, does not disperse itself. It's still contained very safely. And um, uh, to add to that, uh, our launchers are becoming more safe. Uh, this is true with all technologies uh, on Earth too. When we first built our first locomotives or machines, um, they would fail. And um, uh, then uh, now we transport nuclear material um, in railways, or we carry them in submarines, or we have them on ships, uh, continually um, operating reactors. So safety is a derived function. We, we, we evolve it over time and rockets now, the Falcon 9 block one, the new, the new one, um, is three times safer, three times safer than the space shuttle. So, so we are evolving uh, safer systems. And um, with regard to uh, using cosmic sources uh, to make um, uh, to make the fuel. Um, uh, uh, it may not be, it may not be the most efficient. But I, under, I think I understand what you mean is to integrate uh, um, the fuel over time using cosmic sources. Um, uh, it may not be, um, it may not be the efficient thing to do, but something to think about. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you just gave me something to think about. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thanks. It, it is an interesting question because there is no easy answer to it. <laughs> There's no yes or no answer. That's, That's right. Uh, thank you for this question. The next question is by Lisa. Hello. Um, well, Hi, I just wanted to ask a more philosophical question, I guess. Um, it's about, you also mentioned sustainable and what it means to different people like concerns um and i would ask also about the orbital endeavors like i learned today um what would be our responsibility or like how can we even justify us just using the space we are using it now and actually more wasting it probably or is it like justifiable in the name of science or yeah, just I think I think I think Lisa hit it on the head. Lisa, this morning, this morning, I woke up and I looked over the slides I was about to send to Sandra, and I said, you know, this slide about sustainability is not complete. And I put in the term environmental sustainability. And it is more important than uh, commercial sustainability. It's more important than uh, uh, than uh, uh, budgetary and uh, you know 
um, other other methods of sustainability. So I introduced that article. Uh, when I when I ran the slides out, I did not see it uh, as clear because I added in a different color. <laughs> but when I send it to your professor, I'll make sure uh, that this is true because you're absolutely on target that environmental sustainability is more important than all the other sustainabilities put together. And I think going to the moon will very quickly teach us, nature will teach us that uh, you cannot mess up the moon because unlike the earth, where if you do something, the atmosphere damps you down. If you mess up on the moon, it spreads all over the place. And uh, you will realize that when, when the first heavy landers hit the moon, because when I did my thesis and I asked Buzz Aldrin, uh, would he fly that machine? Uh, <laughs> he called me aside in the corridor and said, I would not because there'll be a lot of debris and, and we don't want debris. Uh, you know, things flying off into orbit and meshing up the place. And uh, if, you, if you flew the starship that Elon Musk wants into uh, on, the, on the lunar surface, after two or three flights, you won't even be able to see the moon as it looks. It'll be, it'll be cloudy <laughs> with all the debris around it. So, so I think orbital debris uh, is a result of us not being sensitive to our awareness of nature, how nature sustains itself. And these are lessons we are learning now in the 21st century. You know, we attribute climate change in many ways to the transition from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. And the geologists say that we are messing up planet Earth. We don't want to mess up other places. And the moon will teach us that very quickly that we cannot do this. Uh, I was sitting in a lecture the other day and um, the LRO observed when the Shange landed that there was, there was an effect around the globe on the moon because of the propellants that were used. So we have to really rethink about how we operate on the moon, land on the moon, do surface activities and come back. And we are doing that. But thank you for that very sharp question, Lisa. I think uh, it's important that our designs show this. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Madhu. Um, we can, we ha had a similar discussion uh -huh. on another talk today. We had a talk by Alexander Hagner where we emphasize the importance of visions. You know, we as architects have some responsibility, as you said. Uh, we are responsible for the dreams we put into other people's head, right? That's right. And, and this is good to know and very important to realize in order to make our life better wherever we are. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think, I think architects have always known this, Sandra. And, uh, uh, you know, when we do our professional licensing, and, um, it is part and parcel of it that, you know, you, you care about the safety and the, the reliability of systems over a period of their lifetime. Um, and, uh, and I mean, all professionals think that way. Um, so it's only natural um, that we pay attention to the environment in which we operate. I mean, how many, how many, um, projects do you know that do not include an environmental impact study? There are none. Everybody will ask, what is the impact of your project where you are impressing it or where you are putting it down? Architects know this better than, uh, better than many people, many other professions. Thank you very much, Madhu, and thank you, Lisa. Interesting idea to follow. That's right. Marcel, please pose your, your next question. 
Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I My question is a good addition to Lisa's question. And I was wondering, you said two times that uh, NASA now wants to focus more on the problem of climate change. But uh, space tourism as it is now is more a problem for climate change, right? Because it causes emission and it causes a lot of energy, material is being used, money is being used. That is not being used to fight climate change. So the question is, how are they trying to tackle these problems? And uh, I may add, you said there's a chance in commercializing it. Um, I personally um, ask the question like, do you not fear that uh, private companies are not, like you just said, um, trying to make it sustainable and but they are just looking for profit and therefore will destroy um, our environment in the process. You know, this, these, are, these are the dilemmas. You know, these are the long-term dilemmas that face us as a species, as um, we promote the economic myth and uh, we follow um, the wealth of nations paradigm by Adam Smith and others and we move into the 21st century thinking the same ways you know, we thought in the 18th or the 17th century. And then we add, um, um, we add profits over everything else. And it destroys, uh, it destroys, um, um, it destroys the vision, <laughs> it destroys communities. And we've seen this over and over. Um, and some people may say, that this is the human predicament, that you know, nothing will change. And when the nuclear, when the Manhattan Project was, uh, um, you, know, you know, was uh, executed, um, you know, uh, Albert Einstein, uh, who had a part in it, uh, said that, you know, with the advent of the, of the power of the atom, everything changed except um, uh, the, and the behavior of humans, uh, you know, and uh, I am of the opinion that, uh, that we should be optimistic, Marcel, um, to change the ways we operate and ever so slowly um, things have changed. We have um, clean water um, we have better air and um, uh, there is a lot of pressure on the um, on the um, commercial community uh, to behave better, and 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 hence uh, these requirements on environmental studies. Um, you know, uh, it's very interesting. And um, if you look um, at the map, there is a a a little state in the southern tip of India, where I was born. Um, it's called Kerala. You know, you can Google it. Uh, the, the government of Kerala uh, has been communist and Marxist uh, for the last 40 or 50 years. And this is interesting because, because there is no, there is no such a uh, nation or, or promoter of such uh, ideals in the world today. And, but but uh, Kerala uh, is the most literate state in all of India. And they have the most number of doctors, the most number of engineers, everybody reads and writes, and uh, they are uh, in, in not so much into capitalism. So when companies came there, and started to deforest, they clamped down very quickly, very quickly. This was 40 or 50 years ago. And now guess what? They have the most beautiful, beautiful forest in all of that area. And uh, they follow rules that are a balance, that, are, that have a balance between what is good for you and what is good for the community and uh, uh, what you should avoid in terms of plundering the wealth of, uh, and so, so um, these are things that happen slowly, I think, but I'm an optimist. 
I have an optimist. We can be better people. We can do better things. And I think architects have a responsibility there uh, to educate uh, people who come and want to plunder, <laughs> plunder the land and society. But uh, and but uh, it is a it is a it is a continuing it is a continuing discussion, Marcel. Thanks for your question. In terms of rocket ships, the rocket that went up this morning uh, burns hydrogen and oxygen um, to produce thrust, and the exhaust is pure water. And I like to mention this that the coming rockets will also use hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, Elon says that the, the uh, uh, methane that he uses is made from the carbon dioxide he pulls out of the atmosphere. So it's carbon neutral. Um, but I am more in favor of Blue, Blue Origins rocketry because uh, it's very clean. Um, and uh, there are many aspects to space activity that suggest a cleaner life. Uh, solar energy is one of them. And um, you know, production of water and storage of water and using water to split it up and use it as storage of uh, power systems. These are things that we use on planet Earth now. So we have to promote those kinds of developments. And uh, um, I don't know, everybody would want to. <laughs> Um, it's just that um, you have to, you have to push, and you have to, you have to draw the lines. Thanks for the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have about ten minutes left, and four questions in the chat, and also two questions via the YouTube chat. Oh, okay. So I'm asking Brent to pose his question, please. Brent Libens. All right. Um, then I go to the next question. Maybe he comes back later. Uh, Paul has a question. Yes, I have actually two questions. And the first one is a follow up question uh, to Marcel. So, when you said NASA is tackling climate change, are they only focusing on their impact on the environment? Or are they also? Um, working with different other agencies to tackle climate change as a whole. And the different question, which is a bit um, different, is like you said, um, sending out information to out outer space um, is a relatively new thing. Um, and aren't there dangers involved with sending out information um, without knowing what will happen to them? That's oh, I, I did not follow the second question, Paul. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so if you send information out to outer space, um, isn't there a certain danger involved with that? And when you don't um, know who the recipient might be. Oh, oh right, 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 okay. Okay, and um, yeah, let, me, uh, let me go with the first one. Uh, NASA is perhaps the only, only space agency that has the maximum number of global engagements and contacts. As of now, I think, I think we have a memoranda of understandings on payloads and experiments with over 130 nations. And the last time I checked, we have about 200 nations, uh, 200 and some nations. So, so the agency is outwardly uh, engaged um, about about uh, uh, all, uh, all areas. And, uh, uh, and we've always had a very powerful, very strong um, branch of earth science and um, climate change is part of it. Um, so, so it goes without saying that uh, the agency uh, has always had an interest in climate change. Uh, Jim Hansen and others uh, were um, early pioneers in warning us about the dangers. And um, uh, we uh, continue, uh, we will have a, I believe, uh, with this uh, sitting of the new 
National Space Council will have the first reports out in November when they have their first meeting. Um, uh, I think uh, you will see a much stronger um, component of um, climate change coming out of NASA, which will affect the whole globe. And uh, the, uh, you know, the Landsat mission just went up. There are several more um, lined up for looking particularly at uh, effluence over city regions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, pollution. Um, ESA has uh, uh, satellites out there um, looking for um, the same. And uh, you can see, uh, you can go on the website and see the satellite imagery over cities and townships right now. Uh, real-time imagery that tells you uh, how, the how the pollution is moving from various cities. Uh, India is on a blacklist for many of the uh, many of the uh, um, many of these uh, uh, pollution problems. China is very big in the pollution arena, um, so so uh, we are monitoring them. And uh, 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 so uh, in that respect, NASA is very very good at this. And with respect to uh, information uh, going out into outer space, I'm reminded uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the professor uh, uh, who passed on recently from Cambridge, who to mention this, we should be careful not to announce our existence because um, aliens may get us. Um, I don't believe that. Um, uh, so uh, uh, that's the quick answer to that. <laughs> okay, thanks. A lot. Um, we have one question by Itsu. I hope I remembered the name. Do Do yes. you know all the uh, names of your students, Sandra? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but it would be good. <laughs> no, uh, did I spell it right now or still wrong? Yes, my name is Ijo. You you oh, read oh, it oh. correctly. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question, Ijo. Please ask your question to Madhu. He also I, has a difficult name. Yes, uh, and I wonder if the space travel becomes more frequent. Uh, does it have any radiation have impact on human or other species? Uh, like, will will there be some new species of variation? Um, I, I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's not good, but uh, after all, all living things have been evolving slowly, uh, but not in this unprecedented way. So uh, I wonder, will this cause some problem? Oh, um, if, I, if I heard you right, you were asking if space radiation um, will be a, a, a difficult issue and whether, yes, uh, like whether uh, there will be some new species of variation. <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, is you, are you a biology student as well? No, I'm an architecture student. Okay, you know, some years ago, um, many years ago, a Nobel was offered to a professor in the United States for studying speciation, speciation. and uh, he mentioned that um, some of the genetic mutations happen because of radiation, uh, you know, splicing and slicing certain DNA, and then it comes back together to form new, um, new species. Um, I'm not worried about that <laughs> for our short uh, aspects. Uh, we are all worried more about uh, astronaut capabilities uh, during a mission. And uh, we worry that um, uh, uh, if, um, if uh, the equity and if the, uh, if the dexterity of a crew member uh, is compromised, um, you may suffer the consequences uh, in mission assurance. So you want to say hello to our, our big guy, Nikan. I think he was walking around, you need to see him. 
uh, he is uh, he is from Mars. Uh, that is sin. Um, but the, uh, my thinking is um, that over a long period of time, those things can happen. But in the time frames that we are considering missions to Mars and so on, we are more interested uh, in, in in the life of the crew. I mean in the physiology and well-being of the crew. Um, uh, and uh, it, to answer your question, uh, you don't have to go to space to species E8 uh, because uh, the hard radiation hits us here on planet Earth all the time. And uh, uh, the scientists tell us uh, it could be uh, a reason for, uh, for speciation, speciation as well. <laughs> Did that answer? Did that answer your question a little bit at least? Uh, I'm not a biologist. Yes. You know. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ichu. Uh, now we have two questions left. One is by Trinker, please. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, it's okay. It's just because my, my last name comes in first. Um, I actually wanted to comment uh, something on the topic regarding sustainability because, before I come to my, uh, my, my other question, because uh, you mentioned that we will learn a lot from, from the moon itself regarding sustainability. And I was thinking that uh, what if this is already too late? I think uh, two weeks ago, I visited an event with the topic, uh, on, uh, it, it was regarding sustainability. And there uh, two concepts were presented. The one, let's say the concept from the old world, uh, uh, which also includes our, uh, our present world now, uh, where they said um, 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 and, and, and building, uh, a, a building could be uh, constructed today, for example, uh, environmental friendly, uh, with uh, 15 per, uh, per, per, per percent uh, less uh, emissions, let's say, just out of the top of my head. And then it will count as an environmental friendly uh, building. And uh, the company that built the building would count as, I don't know, uh, yeah, pro -su sustainability. But then they said, all this reduction won't help us change the paradox uh, in, 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 in the way of, uh, uh, of, of how we think towards sustainability and then say a much better uh, a building could be for the future uh, in terms of sustainability could be like uh, we built uh, 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 a building that let's say at the end of its life cycle you could uh, tear it apart and like uh, uh, throw it uh, in a forest and it would not uh, affect the forest and I was thinking since we don't have all this concept already implemented or developed here on earth wouldn't it be like a super extreme experiment to have it tested on the moon? Because uh, first of all, I think it should work on the planet before we then go out to, 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 to the moon. Because uh, yeah, in, in, in my vision, the moon somehow becomes uh, an experimental place for all of those uh, concepts maybe. You know what I mean? Well, Ilian um, uh, is uh, thinking deep. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, you know, I too believe that um, everything we do to disturb nature, any kind of disturbance in nature, um, has a negative consequence. And we know that from past experience. Um, but uh, and that is the human predicament uh, in many ways, uh, Elian, that uh, mm -hmm. we, um, we try to experiment and with materials, structures, ways of living. And you can go back, uh, even look at, um, uh, look at uh, old civilizations over the past 5,000 years. Um, in India, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a faith uh, called Jainism. You may want to look them up. Uh, they are very keen not to disturb nature. Uh, that is, they don't want to uh, want to transform or reshape things in nature. Um, they have a, um, a worldview which says that uh, um, uh, you should not disturb nature, which means 
And then you extrapolate that and you go like, oh, what do we do then? Uh, you know, uh, you'll have a paralysis uh, through that kind of thinking and that you cannot engage in um, to, uh, to build and renew. Um, the reason I brought up the moon uh, as a, as a um, teacher uh, for, uh, for, um, for future living is because um, the environment of the moon is uh, probably um, um, three or four orders of magnitude more sensitive uh, to change than it is on earth. So if we go there and do something like we do on earth, the ramifications and the effects on the moon will be very quick to see. And we are already seeing that from some of our landings and so on. Um, so, uh, so when you see that quickly, um, you we will react quickly uh, to nature. Um, and this happened uh, in the 1960s when we were throwing bombs, atomic bombs all over the world, um, underwater, on the water, in the atmosphere, underground. And then some wise guy said, we're gonna burst it up in space. Uh, we did that. And uh, the reaction was immediate in nature. Um, uh, the ionosphere went bonkers. Uh, the, 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 um, the surrounding um, uh, atmosphere where it is uh, electrically charged, um, it caused some very bad reactions uh, from which uh, we are not yet completely, um, completely um, uh, um, uh, cleaned. Um, so all of a sudden they said, no, no, no more bombs. We cannot do bombs in space because you're gonna, you're gonna have reactions on earth and nature on us. And that kind of reaction um, when it's done elsewhere will also change us very quickly. Um, so um, all these things we do um, have repercussions and it, it makes us better. It makes us more sensitive and more aware. And that is why we have disciplines like um, um, eco-technology and environmental engineering, uh, which are very, very important disciplines, you know, with 30 and 40 year um, the period since it's, since their inception that tell you that um, uh, we are paying attention, maybe not enough, but we are getting better. We are becoming more sensitive and more aware. I always write that, uh, Sandra, I always write that we are becoming a more sensitive and a more aware species. After yeah, all, yeah. You know, we are a, we are a, a narrow uh, sliver of the biosphere. And we create a lot of mess. Oh gosh, we create a lot of mess. And uh, uh, that's a good, good, good thinking. And, uh, you know, I think buildings can be renovated. You know, I, I find it fascinating that in the United States, that buildings have a lifetime of 30 or 40 years, we crush them and build them anew. Whereas in Europe, uh, you rehabilitate them. Uh, you know, your homes are hundreds of years old and um, you know, people don't talk about it because it's part of your lifetime. You know, if you go to India too, there are homes that are hundreds of years old. Um, you go to old civilizations, you see that. And so I think, I think we will continue to become better, uh, become, become more silent and, and responsive to um, uh, to developments. Uh, thank you for that question, Ellen. I hope you, I hope you, I hope you, I answered a little bit. Of yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Uh, I actually had another question, but I think uh, I used I up already my my Elian, question time, Elian, right? Yeah. Elian, sorry, we yeah. have to be <laughs> ten minutes over All right. time. All right. And we have one last question from Elif. I hope this is spelled right, Elif. This is yes, yes, that's right. 
I, I know, I know Ellie. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll talk more. Please, Elif, one last question and then we have to wrap up the session. Yeah, if you had asked my question on the YouTube, that one I would ask. Uh, please do. Choose a question. You ask a question to Madhu. Yeah, my question is about actually the Moon and Mars uh, quakes. Uh, because uh, as I saw that on the designs of the Moon base or Mars habitats, uh, we always consider about the radiation mostly, but what about the uh, like wind effect or the earth earthquakes? Like the pardon, the moon quakes and Mars quakes. Uh, what kind of statics we have to think uh, in the design of space architectural uh, structures? Um, the moon uh, uh, is very quiet seismically, Elif, and. Yes. Um, uh, of course, there is no atmosphere on the moon. And the moon is one of the most dormant bodies in our solar system. And that is also the reason we think that we can use the moon as a, um, as a preserver of solar system records over a billion years, over a thousand million years. But on the Mars, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, we know that, you know, on the moon too, there are very, very small um, um, earthquakes, um, mainly because of the tidal movements between the earth and the moon um, as we go, as we spin around each other. Um, and so the moon flexes a little bit, but those are very, very small, less than one in the Richter scale. Um, and uh, on Mars, uh, so we have uh, the atmospheric movements and dust storms and so on, but they are all very, very, very slight. Um, so, in terms of um, um, in terms of um, physical parameters to consider, the critical ones are the extreme temperature ranges that we are not used to on planet Earth. Um, on the Moon. Um, without a, a stabilizing atmosphere, um, the temperature fluctuation is up to 300 uh, degrees um, plus or minus. And on Mars, uh, it's much less because we have thin blanket of carbon dioxide air, but it's still very extreme. Um, so that is the first important thing, um, along with radiation. And uh, I think one way to avoid that, I think uh, your professor will tell you, is that to go underground. And, um, you know, it would be like um, the astronaut caveman um, era where you come with all these fantastic tools and equipment and you still got to live in a cave. Um, but you know what? Um, if you look at cave living, people have lived in caves and continue to live in caves, even in Europe um, where and people live uh, in beautiful shelters um, underground. Uh, so that's, those are the important things to think about. <laughs> of course, uh, as uh, your earlier lecturer may have mentioned, you need to have food. And so green, <laughs> greenery is critical. And in both of these instances, Moon and Mars, it's going to be very difficult uh, to, um, uh, to produce food and we need to study that, that uh, in great detail. Thank you for your question, Lily. Madhu, I thank you a lot. And I have noted down something that you said earlier. You said, unless you create, you don't know what is right or wrong. I like that a lot as a conclusion for the students um, that they should experiment, think, be courageous to think in the wrong direction, come back, change, you know. Uh, thank you for this um, broad view of space architecture. You, it's a pleasure. Uh, you're very welcome, uh, Sandra. And I, I appreciate you bringing up that point. I mean, I mean, that is what we do in schooling, isn't it? Uh, to pull out their creativity and appreciate 
uh, and what is correct and what is wrong. And unless you do the wrong thing, how would you know what is right? Um, and uh, that is the that is the process. <laughs> That's a continuing process. I'm so happy to have and listen to all of you. And, uh, and good luck with um, your your um, emerging fields in architecture course. Um, you know, architects more than many other disciplines, I think the law too, um, and maybe doctors too, are open to, to ideas because it, can, it enriches their, uh, their profession and their careers and their education. Um, and the courses like this really enrich uh, the architect's mind because um, when you design, uh, many times, uh, uh, parameters that come in from um, uh, outside of your uh, focused view uh, affects your design, sometimes subconsciously, sometimes consciously. And I think um, the courses like Emerging Fields and Architects does that, Sandra. And I congratulate you on your course. And uh, uh, to all of you, uh, enjoy. <laughs> enjoy the rest of your course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day or you good too. night. You all too. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Thanks. Bye.